Yeah, and I actually was up late. I Well, I've been sort of teaching design students in China as public diplomacy because um, oh, it's just like I'm. it's the movie I did. You know the movie? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But like, there's a whole thing. We with... are we are live, by the way. So, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a whole. That's one topic is public diplomacy. Um, the other thing I think Philip wanted me to talk about was um, I don't know if he told you about the fact that I've been posting salads on my Instagram. <laughs> well, no, everyone listening now will want to go see the salads, man. And <laughs> and while you're on it, man, a big thank you too to Philip Martin for uh, putting us together. That was that was really cool of him to do that. Yeah, he's a wonderful neighbor. He he lives above me, and we met each other when he moved in, uh, and we, we actually bonded over a lot of the things that we have in common, some of which is I used to be a former dancer, uh, and then obviously a lot to do with emotional and psychological and physical health. We, we share that in common. Uh, you know, this is stuff that I've been doing all my life, not my career, not what I do for a living, and not what I'm passionate. It's like, it, it is what I'm passionate about, but it's not what I get paid to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny, the things that we are typically passionate about uh, end up uh, not being our career. But for, well, for what you're doing, though, the, the film that you've made coming off the your architecture background, um, I have to tell you, I've read an article that Philip sent me today, um, and... Uh, I'll, I'll probably get with it. Was it with the raging? Uh, maybe you can help if I can give you that much. With the vi with the virus, with um, the media burning and the virus raging, should we look to architecture? Right now, I have to admit, me. You know, when I first saw that, I was like, "Oh boy." Uh, <laughs> I'm like, "Really, really? Okay, so it's going to be architecture that saves us, right?" And I, I'm well, just no. being honest. No, no, I, I, no, no. I'm just being honest, right? I was like, "Oh boy, what has Philip got me into?" And and <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. And then I read your article and I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. I, I man, there were so many levels of that article that you wrote where I had to stop and go, oh, man, I never thought about it like that. And now when you brought up the World Fairs in, in the article there, I even had to stop and remember what what's the World's Fair again? I I couldn't you know, for a second it split. It slips your mind. And because you don't hear about it much, right? And and well, so well, the World Fair one was a different article. I didn't mention the World Fair in in in, in um in the media burning the virus. I had I wrote two articles recently. Oh, so per perhaps yeah. I just kept scrolling because I wanted to be more reading, and I may have went to the other article. Yeah, you might have gone to. T I, they both came out. One came out October thirtieth, I think. And the set, the one I wrote recently, which is the one you were just mentioning, mm -hmm. that one I wrote. I wrote in the middle of our COVID confinement <laughs> because I felt like I needed to do something uh, in response to um, a couple of the, the reaction you had when you said, oh, no, that architecture is going to solve everything. I did not want to do that. And that's exactly why I wrote the article, <laughs> because I just we, we, we call that in my profession a P architecture article, which is like it's PR for architecture. No way, Jose, was I trying to do that. Well, um, I, let me tell you, if that's PR for architecture, it was actually uh, the, the second thing I wanted to be when I first got to college, right? And then for me, um, like some of us like to say, which probably isn't true, I have to do how much math? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm out, right? I was kind of like, all right, that was fun to think about. And uh, But as I read through the article, I think the I, I would almost argue even with you in your own article that you, you mentioned the World's Fair, but maybe I just kept reading, right? But but there were so many things where I stopped in that article, and 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 man, it is like that. Then when you started connecting virtual media, right, and how we've come yes. uh, un yeah. uh, unattached to our worlds. Yes, and you're not going to believe that, but that came from a 1936 article written by a cultural theorist that I was exposed to in graduate school, and I never forgot it. So when I was in graduate school, I was being exposed to these amazing thinkers, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's all these cool people that are really smart out there, and they were talking about stuff, and they were in the avant-garde. Uh, this guy that I'm talking about 
his name it was Benjamin Adorno. I'm sorry, Walter Benjamin and his and his um his his friend was Theodore Adorno. So there was this very famous dialogue that went on between the two of them. And uh, th- th- I never forgot that dialogue. And I read it and reread it over 25 years because I never forgot it because it's like a lot of the stuff that I referenced in the article I wrote, like the science fiction uh, and the the stories about our relationship to technology being kind of uh kind of like a love hate relationship right, we right. love tech yeah we love technology but we also don't we hate it we we and this is what i wanted to touch upon because what i saw was that we were out of balance and uh i think that a lot of us feel out of balance and i thought that by providing this argument and giving people insight into what architects do it might help them find a way of coping with the chaos, the disenfranchisement, because we're in a we're living in this world right now where we don't know what is real, what is fake, what is, you know, who can we rely on when even our experts don't know what the truth is and what the facts are because they're evolving every single day. And and it's nobody's fault. It's just that we don't know a lot about this pandemic, this particular virus. And um, so that's one of it. So one of it has to do with um, not knowing much about um, this very dangerous virus. And the second thing has to do with media. And that's the one that I think, I don't don't know who your listeners are, but um, if they're very interested in art movements uh, and literary movements like George Orwell, um, 1984, a Philip Dick, uh, you know, Fahrenheit 451 with, there's so many different stories throughout our human history, you know, and I even went all the way back to Icarus and Daedalus yeah. because I, you know, like a lot of people think that when you, when that, that particular parable was about, you know, the young people, not paying attention to their fathers and their mothers because (laughs) let me just rehash what that Greek myth was about. So Icarus was um, the son of Daedalus. Daedalus was the guy that invented the labyrinth that the Minotaur was in. And I believe he was imprisoned and he had to escape and he and his son were imprisoned by the Minotaur and they had to escape. So what he did was because he was such a great thinker and innovator and inventor he invented he created these wings with uh, but he put them together with feathers and wax i believe that's what what it was and so when he was ready to escape he obviously gave a pair of wings to his son icarus and if those of you vaguely remember the story because i heard it when i was in grade school and uh so he warned his son not to fly too close to the sun and i you know and of course his son was completely heady with the opportunity of flight and wanted to fly too close to the sun so he flew really close to the sun and the wax melted and he perished by falling down into the i don't know where he fell but but <laughs> somewhere um, somewhere <laughs> so most people think of that as like oh you have to listen to your parents because they're wiser than you <laughs> I remember this myth as, oh my gosh, this is kind of like the same thing that when you look at Frankenstein and when you look at all of, even religion, if you if you really think about it, if you think about our, our fear of death and our desire to reach heights and things that we don't really, you know, we, that, that are bigger than ourselves. Yes. Uh, that sort of element of the desire and the need to touch upon the divine, to reach the stars, to extend our lives, to, to do all of these things is usually handled through our knowledge, our science and our technology. We've managed to extend our lives. We've created better lives and better opportunities for you know civilization to thrive. And that is so much captured in so many stories from 
Daedalus and Icarus to Frankenstein to, and you know, I can just keep, just keep going. Um, and I could have quoted other parables like films. I actually wanted to quote some films, but then I realized that most of the films were actually based on stories that were passed down uh, through literature and written by authors and such. So I ended up just going back to, to, um, to really referencing in my article, I referenced uh, the writers and I referenced uh, perform artists. Basically. Yeah, was the t the TV. Uh, I I had never heard of that. And oh, <laughs> I had never heard of that. And so when you first when I first read it and I went and I, and I saw the oh they turned the cameras on them to see what the real news was. Man, that part I was kind of like, oh, well, spoiler alert for people. Sorry about that. I I get excited. <laughs> but yeah, that that entire experiment. Well, they don't know what the experiment is, right? They we can leave them with that one. Uh, but it, that hit me. I was like, man, that was brilliant. Yeah, so people should look up the ant farm, which let me just give you a little brief history of the ant farm. The ant farm was an art collaborative, and it was started by Chip Lord and, and Chip Lord and Doug Michaels. And both of them went to architecture school, and you know they were these crazy 1960s artists, and they were so excited uh, with lots of opportunities happening uh, during that time period. So they believed uh, that there were, were things that needed to be said, that people were not attuned to. And in, in many ways, that is what great art tries to do, is it tries to shine a light on things that we might not be aware of. And so in this particular spectacle, because this was one thing that they did, they have other things that they've done which several of your, I don't know, a lot of people in America might know about some of the artworks they did. The Ant Farm also did, the uh, most famous piece they ever did was called Cadillac Ranch, which is in Amarillo, Texas. And it's the sculpture of 10 Cadillacs buried at an angle um, with the tail fins. And in fact, yeah. Hard Rock Cafe copied their work of art and they actually got sued oh, but wow. the, yeah and uh that, the, that's funny um, where, where i live um i live beachside right now over here in uh, new smyrna beach right florida uh right on the the middle part where it gets real woodsy right there, there's an rv park and camp and they have done that with rvs yeah they done that and i didn't know to connect that well this is stuff that was going on before um you know actually i was born around that time period and you're much younger than me, so so probably you know, that's the problem with history, is that some you know it gets lost very easily. And how do you make sure that people know about these things? Well, you have to share the stories. You have to get it out there. And I um, knew about it because I studied it when I was in architecture school, and they were mentioned in my history curriculum for these sort of performance artists. Uh, and so they did that. And they were also the other one of the other pieces they were famous for was this piece called the Eternal Frame, which is a parody of the Eternal Frame, uh, Eternal Flame, because what they did was they reenacted the Kennedy assassination in Daly Plaza. And Whoa. the two. Yeah, they had the artists. They dressed up as Jackie and um, and John F. Kennedy. It was so convincing because if you're familiar with the Sapruder films, yeah, um, yep, mm -hmm. there, I mean, you just need to look all of this up on Wikipedia, which is like sometimes <laughs> I just have to refresh my memory and I go back to Wikipedia and I also write for Wikipedia. Uh, um, that's so, funny you say that, but I did that when so I was like World's <laughs> Fair when I was going there and I looked up World uh -huh. Fair and then I'm like, next thing I know, I'm like thumbing reading this entire thing of like, I didn't know that. Like, yeah. I, I didn't know the Eiffel Tower, right? All these things I was learning, I'm like, oh, even the needle, the space needle. Oh, my God. So wh where are we in this race, right? If it was the Olympics or something, you would have heard about the U.S. being involved in some sort of thing. Like now this this third era, the what is it, um, nationalism era, I think. They were talking about the three eras of the World Fair. And, uh, yeah, that's what, go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I mean, that, so, like, we could talk about, a lot of different stuff here, Adam, because <laughs> we could talk about world fairs. We can talk about. Well, you were talking about. Well, you were we talking about, about Wikipedia. Media. Yeah, so you're well, talking about Wikipedia. So I was like, yeah, that's funny. You do. Yeah, I told you, remember in the email, I will squirrel us off enough. <laughs> uh, right? So the, the fact is, but it is called the cognitive rampage, right? So uh, part of Holy. rampaging wherever we go. 
Well, I've been learning a lot about the psychology of space as a result of the work that I've been doing. Uh, and so like the words disenfranchisement is actually a psychological term. So I, you know, I, I brought it into my discussion. I actually thought about bringing in cognitive dissonance at one point, yeah. but you know, I really am not a psychology expert or anything. I am a design expert. Uh, so I could talk about a lot of things. So if you wanted to talk about what the article was referencing, because we started our discussion about how, why did I write this article? Mm -hmm. I, I wrote this article because so many of us are isolated at home. And there are a lot of people, and I'm one of them, I live alone, so I don't get to see people at my own That's home. That's tough. That is it's, tough. Yeah. It's been really hard, but I've been lucky because I followed some of the things that I learned in architecture, which is, you know, I mentioned in the article that, you know, by learning a little bit from architecture, we might be able to cope a little bit better, or I allude to the fact that we could actually move towards, um, I guess, a better understanding of what's happening right now. And that is what my intent was in writing the article, because the profession of architecture has actually been uh, doing some really stupid things sometimes. <laughs> like one of the things that they did recently was like some of the articles that came out sounded tone deaf. And one of them is like so some of them are about pushing design as a solution for everything. And that to me is, you know, that's why I laughed when you were saying that. Right, <laughs> right. The title of the article, this is what we need to solve uh, COVID-19 is architecture. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to do that. And then the second problem is some of, like there was an article that came out in the Philadelphia Inquirer um, when Black Lives Matter came about, and they said buildings matter too. And I'm like, oh no! What? This is that. too. We've gone too far. We've gone too far. <laughs> if we start saying buildings matter, uh, God forbid, all buildings matter. Um, <laughs> right, they're not people. People matter more than buildings. And in fact, architects, we we are ethically bound to protect, to make sure that our buildings do not harm human life, you know? And so we put lives over buildings, you know? <laughs> so I just- All right, we, like, we have, well, I think we've covered the PR, the, the PC <laughs> basis, right, of what, of what we said. No, but in uh, what I liked in the article is how you were trying to, I don't know, I'm guessing, draw a correlation to the reflection of our built society, uh, sort of as the reflection of the society as itself. Right. That the city it's built around us or the lack thereof. Right. Or the um, thought into design or something somehow is also reflecting a, a current state of where we are in the United States. Well, everything I do is about design and architecture and identity. So how that refers to what you just said is that, yes, absolutely, that. Um, the city is a reflection of us, but it's also what we create is a reflection of us, which, by the way, is what I did. I show in the movie for the World's Fair movie that I made that. Um, so the movie I made is about um, how our American identity has become associated with commercialized just the wrong message. And it's actually not who we are as Americans, but the rest of the world associates us with you know, commercial, capitalistic, whatever. In fact, I, you know, I'm American. I was born in Philly. And, and so I'm like, even though I'm Chinese, I, you know, they don't consider me Chinese when I go to China. They can tell right away that I'm not <laughs> because of my attitudes, the way I, you know, you know, go about doing things. So this whole notion of what we create is a reflection of who we are does in fact mean that the buildings we create is a larger container to, to also not just reflect who we are, but to protect the body. So if you, in architecture, we immediately start to deal with the fundamentals of the relationship of the body to the human environment. So if you think about it, just like in terms of like a Russian doll, one of those like Russian, you know, uh, what are they called? The... The sort of periscopic, yeah, those I, Russian oh, I doubles. definitely know. Yeah. I, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> That's why I'm like, yeah, keep going, Mina. <laughs> so those Russian dolls, let's. We're at the center. We're the tiniest little doll, okay? And then a room might be surrounding our body, and that room, that second shell that's protecting that little inner doll, is like a room. And then. 
the room is like perhaps a building. And then the building is, let's say, um, a neighborhood. A neighborhood is, um, you know, it just gets like a city. Yeah, a yeah. City keeps is, getting larger, yeah. So these are all the systems that we have created to organize and better human society. So if you think about, oh, I, I didn't even skip one, one layer here. I forgot one layer, our clothing. Our clothing is here to protect our bodies from the environmental forces of nature, you know, to keep us warm, to keep us dry, that kind of thing. A building or a room is also, you know, done in the same way. And in fact, architects talk about this. We call like the building elements the skin and the bones, or we call it okay. the shell. You know, we, we also say shell and structure. We call it facade. We, we use all kinds of language to draw that kind of connection because it helps us design better buildings when we think about it that way. Uh, and it's not like there, there are so many elements that go into the design of our spaces that we can go into. But that's kind of, you know, no, I, I'm interested. I, I'm, I'm really interested in, um, in more detail about what you mean. I'm I'm trying to imagine, right, that. Um, what walking around, looking at cities for an architect such as yourself, um, especially not an architect, you're not a fly-by-night architect, you have some serious accomplishments under your belt, what you do. <laughs> um, so um, what that may must be like walking around looking at structures, right, and how that comes through your filtered eyes about what you've learned, what you know, what that means, a, a, a reflection of it, what you would have done differently, right? It's kind of like walking around, whatever you're doing, you start to notice it more. Oh yeah, we're hypercritical. I mean, <laughs> it's it's we can't help it, but I mean, it's, it's actually if you want to do a joke, just get a bunch of architects like I I teach at USC School of Architecture and anytime there is a design project affiliated with our school, it's like a nightmare. Everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Will anything ever get done? Hard to say. So, you know, the, there is that element that I do walk around being very hyper aware of, of the spaces that um, that we come into to contact with. I'm not always critical, though, because, you know, I am very open minded about recognizing that buildings are, you know, are there. But we actually, as architects, don't really design majority of buildings that are built. We actually only do something like 15% of them. Uh, and it's because of the problem that people don't, well, a lot of people have the misapprehension that they think that architecture is too expensive and it's unnecessary and it's not, you know, they can't afford architecture. And I suppose on a like, you know, a, like a like a single person or a single family, unless they're independently wealthy, it's hard to like be able to afford an architect, you know, like afford an architect or afford a, um, a a lawyer. But it's not that's not what I try to talk about. In fact, you know, I am a licensed architect. I've actually done some buildings, but I actually focus on really sharing my knowledge with the public about how they already are involved. They already have a relationship to architecture, and it's just there for them to discover it. And I'm here to assist in that. Yeah, when you were you started talking about how it's the architecture we look to for shelter, uh, and I and I scrolled us off there. When you were starting to talk about the relationship of how they already are involved, how, how is the human being already involved in the architecture or, around them? Well, the the simple. Th fact that like they're occupying they live in a, a building apartment a house the fact that they leave their house and they go to different places like an office they go shopping they go get food like we're all doing takeout obviously or we're like I'm going to the grocery store I'm actually cooking I, I haven't really done as much restaurant um, yeah. uh, patronizing you I should me, do more. you and me both <laughs> But, you know, so each time we engage with a public space, when we go to a park, when we go to any kind of public building or a retail establishment, you are having a relationship to architecture. You just might not be aware right. what, yeah, you don't know how designers, architects, um, and contractors and developers have shaped your experience. But I'm actually here to illuminate and explain all of this 
Uh, and so that's kind of my role. And what I decided to do at one point was to, to, to change careers in some ways and become more of a public scholar. And uh, in fact, that is why I've been nominated for fellowship is because of the, ex the extracurricular work I do because I don't get paid to do this. I raise money to do this. Like it's a passion project for me. I uh, go out there and speak on behalf of what people's relationship to design is. So I've done it for, um, like I actually was on National Geographic on a, a show that went global um, with, it was called, uh, what was it? Uh, I was on Building you know, building the Future episode. I can't remember, the, it was um, The Journey of Humankind with, I forget what, um, uh, I, forget his, I forget the host's name, but it's, it's, it's in my notes somewhere. But, you know, I've been on National Geographic. I make movies. I've made uh, small videos. Uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, not the current mayor, but Eric Garcetti, not Eric Garcetti, but uh, Antonio Villagorosa, he, his office and his deputy mayor, um, Eileen Adams, came to me and asked me to make a video about the innovative architecture in L.A. So I went ahead and made it and just did it on my own. And like, this was done in 2011. Can um, people see I, it anywhere? Yeah, it's just, I gave it to the public. A lot of the stuff that I do is is free to the public, but not everything. Cause like the one I just finished, oh my God, that one, <laughs> the movie I just finished what, what, took seven what, years of my life. <laughs> seven years, I was gonna say, what, years. what walked you into doing Faces of a Nation? So the, yeah, the movie's called Face of a Nation. Basically. What happened? To, yeah, what happened to the World's Fair? Um, and when I started the film, I wasn't planning on making a you know a one-hour movie, which is what it ended up being. Uh, I've had 30 national screenings, except for COVID, just postponed. I just got an email today from the Denver Art Museum. I was supposed to go there next. Uh, they said, we're still going to do your screening once we can do screenings again. Oh, once we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I am trying to do a, I'm trying to do a drive-in movie theater. I thought that would be kind of cool. That's smart. Yeah, you we, know, um, I'm in the comedy world, and a lot of comics have turned to doing uh, stand-up in uh, drive-ins. I love the idea of a drive-in movie, you know. And I was going to, I've offered to do it for, like, I don't, I'm not charging the organization because this was my public service. I just don't want to lose any more money, which is like, <laughs> because like making a documentary is like the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, it, think of it as my 10 year old daughter right now, because it's now 10 years. I finished it two, three years ago, mm -hmm. but I'm still screening it in year three. Uh, the film is listed on the State Department website um, because I'm actually in a, I'm a, I mean, I'm not sure how, how much I can say right now, but. I'm doing what I can to help our U.S. pavilion for the next World's Fair, which okay. is going to be why I have been helping <laughs> <laughs> secretly behind the scenes. Hey, that, that's something worth tagging on to. But how, how did you so seven? Well, 10 years old now. But, but what pushed you to, to make this? What was the video? What led you into it? OK, so I was sent to China in 2009 to make a short movie for the School of Architecture. While I was there, I saw this poster for the Shanghai World Expo. And I'm like, what? Wait, isn't that the same thing as a World's Fair? I was thinking, I'm like, I think it is. And, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know they were still going on. So that's, a, that's I, how I felt when I was like, wait, is that a, that's a thing? <laughs> that's, yeah, I felt I know, the same way. <laughs> so I came back from the trip and I started writing some grants. And I won. Um, about like I think it was like eleven thousand dollars in small grants. Okay, this was the period that I was also discovering I've got a talent for fundraising, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't do it through Kickstarter or any kind of crowdfunding. I just am apparently good at talking and and convincing people because people who have written me checks when I've at, been at like just regular parties. Yeah, we've already um, mailed ours off. We couldn't have. <laughs> I mean, I could probably teach a fundraising, um, really the, the biggest secret for fundraising, just so just so you're re everybody wants to know this, is to, number one, it's got to be something you completely 1,000% believe in, and it's a passion project. Number two, you don't ever want to, in any way, think that 
the money is going to come from any particular source because if you put your magic out there, it, it's going to come to you. <laughs> it, you just don't, you know, don't have the wrong ideas and just put put the the thought, the the good feelings out there and go out there and share your passion and then the money will come. Because that's, I seriously, that's how I raised 327000 in grants and donations. Wow. All yeah, right. I, yeah, it's, it's true. <laughs> Well, a lot of people wait, right? We, we wait on how we can find funding, right, to start our passion project or do something. Or, you know, the, the financial advisor in your mind tells you to say, all right, let's budget this out. We have to plan this. Well, Once I'm we have this. Good. I do. I'm very good at, I mean, I'm a child of immigrants. My mom and dad were born in China. They came to the United States. So let's I'm gonna kind of try to swing back to your original question about how I started this movie. So I ended up going to China with a small team. And because I teach at USC, I, at the time I'd been um, learning about production, film production, because I teach at USC. We have one of the top film schools. We also have one of the top architecture schools. So we have two great schools. And we were really trying to learn how to collaborate. But I'm not tenure track, so I had to go get the funding myself. And um, and so I started with 11,000 of small USC, like actually USC grants. Then I was able to dump, like I actually got more companies to donate. And then I attracted like some sponsors like Vizio. And I didn't, you know, I just went out there and just started talking about it. And they just decided to give me they, some money. They hear the ripples and come back. Yeah. And so then we went, we actually went in 2010 to the Shanghai World Expo. And this is the stuff that, no, but not many Americans know about this. At the time that the last, not the last World Fair, but the 2010 Shanghai World Expo was the biggest event in human history. Most attendees. In, yes. It was 73 million people. Oh, my God. Physically went. Now, I think it was like 11 million international visitors and 61, 62, 61, 62 million Chinese um you know, uh, people from China, from all over the country coming to go see all the countries putting on their best show about what each nation was about. Yeah, for, so, for those that didn't look up Wikipedia and read it and refresh their memory like I did, for people listening, um, can you kind of walk through, I'll, I'll bring us back here, but the World Fair itself, right? Like what, what, what that is, so people understand. Yeah, so just a brief history of the World's Fair. Um, it was actually, you know, the Olympics started in Greece, right? And it was about friendly competition through athletics. The World's Fair started in 1851 as a combination of, um, at the time they wouldn't call it public diplomacy, but they would be like international relationships, a sharing of culture, but also sharing um, products and trade, okay? So it's both about trade between countries to... But it was also about, you know, having good relationships with countries. So it's both of them were really important at the first World's Fair, which was in 1851 in London. Now, m many of you who have ever been to London or the UK probably have heard of the Crystal Palace, they, you know, or, or you might not have seen it because it's actually burned down. Uh, but if you've ever seen a glass greenhouse, that was an inspiration of the 1851 Crystal Palace, which was the largest glass structure in the world. And we actually show it in our movie, okay, in old photographs. And, uh, and, and so what the World's Fair was all about, and it still continues to be about this, is about showcasing the best of a country's culture, technology, and uh, arts, science, technology, and culture. So the world... The, the Olympics showcases our best athletes performing in friendly competition. And, you know, people know about that because it's televised and not like not everybody can afford to go to wherever the host country is. In the case of the World's Fair, which is also known as a World Expo, that is a situation where people of the country that's hosting will travel to come and see all the other countries and it's a really important opportunity for everyday citizens to get to know each other. Now, of course, we, as Americans, we like to travel the world, and you know, we do that to a certain extent. We travel, and we we share our culture through um, through our travels and such. 
but it's not it can be really expensive and stuff so when you do have an opportunity for like if we could have a world's fair we we've had several world's fairs in the united states um one of the first ones was in philadelphia uh 18 i'm trying to remember what year 18 wait 1851 18 uh 76 i think it was and then um and then 18 93 was Chicago's first one, and then 1904 was St. Louis, then there was 1933 in Chicago again, and then New York had two, one in 1939 and another, wait, so 39, and the other one was in 1964-65. Now, there are going to be some of your listeners that are in different parts of the country, they're going to say, did we have one in... New Orleans and St. Uh, New Orleans wasn't the only one. Is that your doggy? <laughs> no, uh, there is. If anybody listening can hear that right now, it sounds like there's a war going on. <laughs> can I you hear the dog barking? It's cute. <laughs> yeah, well, he's barking at the fireworks. I'm not sure if you can hear those or not. Oh. Can you oh, hear I that? Hear yeah, a little bit. I yeah, feel like I'm that. field reporting from Afghanistan or something right now. Like, <laughs> they are seriously launching some fireworks, and uh, one of my dogs uh, decides that. Yeah, they he... don't like fireworks. <laughs> no, he, but he, he attacks them, so he's not near afraid of them as he'll like let me at him. And so he's in the, he's in the living room trying to get to the fireworks. I'm listening for a minute, like, is that an automatic weapon? <laughs> I'm like, what is well, you happening? Have sound, you have sound um, panels in in your um, your um, studio. I can see them, and I have sound abatement windows because I'm actually at LAX area. No. Uh, so the planes fly over really loud and stuff. Um, anyway, those fairs are, have been a big deal. When I say that they're important opportunities, when we used to host them, we would have a lot of countries come here and we would be able to sample and get an understanding of what people from um, Brazil or Afghanistan or, you know, and like all kinds of countries that we might never be able to visit would come and they would showcase their arts, culture, science, technology, if they had science and technology. Some of them did, some of them don't. Um, and this was actually really important because it, it created a foundation for what uh, is only happening on uh, what I call, what, what Edward R. Murrow's called the last three feet. So if you Google search the last three feet, that is basically this idea of people to people relationships, face to face, which, you know, the article Media Burn, which doesn't seem to be about World's Fairs. In fact, I am actually alluding to the face to face connection, which none of us are able to do during COVID, which is part of one of the problems of why we're feeling so disenfranchised, so disembodied, so incredibly depressed some people have become depressed so like you know segueing back to the article what i was alluding to is if you do things like order your environment like did you notice when people were cleaning house a lot yeah yep that is one of the things that will help you feel better other things you can do you can also do things like work out aerobic exercise because you're engaging with your body um Remember I mentioned the salads on my Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> right. I started losing my appetite because I wasn't around people. And I actually like to cook for people, but I wasn't, I, I don't really have that much interest cooking for myself. I, well, that so, connection is so important, even on the, on the psychology side or even on the addiction side, right? I mean, there's tons of research coming out, right? It's lack of being connected into your environment with people. Uh, and, and having strong relationships, right? Some people are connecting it just to that, but um, I wouldn't say it's just that, but I would say it's certainly a, a huge part that, that, that plays a role in things like addiction and, and the things we're seeing now, right? Is the rise, like you said, the rise of depression, anxiety, and these things that are happening because of uh, our confinement. You know, I, yes. I, I actually do a, a, a part of a stand-up bit where I said that the, uh, the government is now asking us to do what the first question is on a depression survey. Are you isolating? Right. So, <laughs> yes, we are. Right. And those are the things in that connection we miss. So that World Fair would bring that worldly connection. But like you well, to your article, right, is that, well, now we don't need to do that because I can go on the Internet. I can search Brazil. Right. And a lot of people when I was doing research for my film, they were like, 
Why do we need to get people together again? We can do it virtually through social media. And so did you notice in my article I talked about the Arab Spring when we thought, wow, what a great opportunity technology has done for us. We can actually connect each other through virtual space. But we didn't realize that it was also an opportunity for trolls to come out and attack each other. Because when you're in virtual space, you're not, you can be anonymous. You can actually... Um, there are more opportunities to just kind of vent without being responsible for your actions. But when you're actually in a physical corporal space, when you're in three feet of space or six feet of space, whatever you want to say, you're going to be on your best behavior because you have a body that needs protection. Like bullets do kill people, you know, whereas fake bullets on a video game don't. And that's the simulacrum. That is virtual realm. And so we're spending all this time interacting, like you and I are doing Skype right now. I just did a Zoom call to 100 Chinese students in China. And I'm, you know, I did a four time zone call with the State Department and London and Dubai like last week. And it's like, it's, that's all we're doing. We're also binge watching Netflix, <laughs> you yes. know, or yeah. Hulu or, you know, satellite cable. And so we're watching other people live their lives on stories in film and television and we're, yet we're not living our we all feel like we've been put on hold like somebody pushed a button and they put us in a cupboard and we're not really living right now and the reason we're not really living is because we're not engaging in space and form in a way that provides us a sense of identity and a sense of who we are through our bodies and so the salads. Let me tell you about the salads. <laughs> so I start losing so the, my appetite. All right. So I thought you were just connecting with salads at the point. I was like, all right, Mina, no, going off the real, rails. There's a madness to the salads. Oh. The, okay. So I was like, why am I buying all this food? Because remember, people were hoarding food and stuff. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I'm like, God, I better buy all these eggs because I might not be able to get eggs anymore. <laughs> you know, and I bought all this chicken and then I bought all this other stuff. And then I'm like, I was making my favorite foods thinking, okay, well, me, this is an opportunity for you to cook for yourself. I would make some of my favorite foods and I would not want to eat it. I literally would like take two bites. It would go into the freezer. And so it kept happening. And then I started losing weight and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And it's like, <laughs> I, it's not like I'm, it's like, I felt guilty because I don't want to waste the food. And I felt like, well, what's going on? And then I tried, I started doing what other people were doing. Did you read about people making all these new recipes, right? Nope. Yeah, everyone's got a cooking show now or a cooking podcast yep. or on YouTube. They're, they're showing all their favorite recipes. Yeah, yeah. They're doing it because they're trying to connect to their sense of taste and a different novelty that they're not getting when they're out in the real world. So by cooking different recipes, they're tuning into their their taste, their smell, their other, their sort of corporal senses. So uh, the unfortunately, the comfort food wasn't doing it for me. So then one day I just looked in my refrigerator and I had roasted some beets and I had like some leftover ranch dressing and I had some, like I had a, the, the makings of a fairly good salad one day. <laughs> so then I started like putting it together. Then I took the time to actually compose it on the plate then I took a photograph of it, you know, like all the millennials and the Y. <laughs> I am not a millennial and I'm not a Y generation. You will not. I would never post fo uh, photos of my food on Instagram. I would roll my eyes. But now you'll see 70 salads on my Instagram. <laughs> now, now look at you. So from, from a, a great architecture, what we get from her Instagram is salad uh, preparation. And um... I, I tweaked the color of the photographs. And then I also connected through color crunch intensity of sharpness all of this sort of corporal stuff you, you were literally a, a salad architect yes and then i actually described the salad in succulent words and stuff like that <laughs> so then everybody started asking me to post salads all the time because they said that they they're losing weight because they're eating healthier they're doing all this stuff and i'm like Oh, I feel like I'm cooking for people again. And then I would <laughs> I would actually eat the salads after I did the post. And then after I did all that tweaking, that creativity, I'd already engaged in my sense of, oh, gosh, look at that colorful red pepper as I was eating it. Do you see how that worked? Yeah, yeah. That, so that's, and so I just did a, 
uh, umami sort of salmon, uh, wasabi and soy crusted salmon uh, sa- cake salad. I did, I've done everything. I just did a Cape Cod one and I felt like I was at the Cape. So, so by doing <laughs> these things, I really feel like I'm getting a sense of living. Well, we're all trying to find in any way we can, right, of any kind of normalization and in trying to find ourselves a lot of times. And now we're left alone with ourselves. So we're sitting at home with just sometimes our own mind to hang out with. Right. And it's 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 a whole new engagement for all of us and what we're doing. Um, but to, to go back we, we started because people don't think about the World Fair, right? Well, why do you have to travel all these places to, to, to make your film, right? Why do we have to reconnect that way? So when I went to China, I filmed something that I did not expect to film. And I came back and I had to make a decision about what to do with what I filmed. So I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I was very disturbed. So I started doing more research and I ended up uncovering an unknown story about the commercialization of our national interest, the representation of the American people, and the defunding of a very important um, part of the representation of the American people. So every country has this thing called a ministry of culture to represent their country to the world through their culture, their art, science, and culture. We defunded and then we eliminated that agency in 1998, 99, and that was two years before the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So if you think about the um, fact that they attacked our symbols of money and war, um, the architecture of the World Trade Center represents money, capitalism, and all that stuff. Sure. That that was what the, a lot of the Middle East associated with that. So I started asking these questions. And remember, everything I do is about architecture and identity. I took on the issue of national identity through what we create uh, in architecture in this film. And because I have an Academy Award-winning producer, I have Emmy Award-winning composer, I learned from the editor of uh, are you? Do you remember the Winona Ryder film called Heather's? Um, um, I, 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 it's a dark comedy, probably before your time. It <laughs> was funny. We, we uh, <laughs> Patricia and I just watched Reality Bites. So when you said Winona Ryder, I was like, please say Reality Bites. We just watched that one. Uh, Heather's, no. Heather's was a dark comedy like Mean Girls. Mm. It was the first Mean Girls, and um, and and so. Uh, the editor of that film, he was a professor at the cinema school and he taught me film story. So over seven years, I pieced this film together and I'm still traveling for it, though I'm now thinking about, um, you know, what I'm going to do now that during COVID. Um, but like, you know, getting back to the, you know, wait, Remind me again your your last question because I kind of <laughs> deviated in so no, many. No, no, we, we, we were talking about the the film and how it kind of started over the seven years, right? And how yeah. um, people you were explaining the World Fair and that kind of actually scrolls off. I asked for that one, but when when you were explaining the World Fair, people come together, share cultures, and connect through um, showing whether it was architecture or just joining their cultures at these World Fairs and how we have yeah. Stepped why back is that important? Them. Why is that important? That was right. your question. Well, like, from why there, should how, we how be the, engaging how, in real estate? Well, how the United States to step back from it, right? They, they weren't really yes, involved because, with it. And they were stepping back because they were thinking, you know what, why do we need to pay for um, this important issue? Because they didn't think it was like, they said that we're already spreading American culture through all our products and brands that have disseminated like all the McDonald's and Starbucks that are in Moscow and everything else. Right. Why do we need to like, spend more of our taxpayer money on representing our country at this big event, right? Which, can, real- which can be expensive, right? Which can be expensive. Yeah, it is expensive, but it's about, let, let's say, it's $60 million every five years because yeah. the World Fair happens every five years. Yeah, I think, okay? we, I think we lose that every 10 minutes in the United States as it yeah. is. <laughs> I think they can budget that. Yeah, it's not a lot, but um, it was during this period in government when... They were trying to defund. They were saying that they were that a big government is not good. Um, I actually have a response for that. Uh, government was created to help 
civilization, just like banks were created to help civilization. Every organization, every entity, every system that mankind created was to help society in some way. So you can't blame the institution or the organization. You have to blame the people behind it uh, because people are the imperfect ones. And, and by the way, the institutions are not perfect either because they're made by us and we're not perfect. So they have to constantly and evolve, evolve and change in order to be able to meet the needs of society towards a better society. You know, so I think it's important for us to say, stay self-critical like it's hard to be self-critical, yeah. but yeah. So why do we not need it? Well, specifically for the very good reason that I don't know if I want everybody in Moscow to think that I'm all about McDonald's, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. If, if, if we're going to be represented on the, the national stage, right. I, th I think, uh, by Coca-Cola and McDonald's, the brands that people know, right. I think it is a reflection of, of us though, right. Because we are that. It's, it is. Yeah. But that's not the best of who we are. I think yeah, the best yeah. of who we are is our ability to be open and have dialogue. And I mean, I don't know how that we're demonstrating that right now in terms of having. <laughs> well, that's I the mean, sad part, though, <laughs> Mina. That's the sad part is that we really do that for what you're talking about. We do, and to watch us fail at it now in the situation we are so terribly, and be divided that way is that's that's part of what makes this what's happening so sad. Yeah, and I think part of it is we have to understand media a little bit. So getting back to the article, this is all connected. Like the article I wrote, the World's Fair film. If you go back to the article, I talk about media burn. And I also talk about this guy named Walter Benjamin who was celebrating a work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. So let's talk about that really quickly. So what he was saying was that the traditional works of art were like sculpture, painting, and buildings, like physical buildings. And that was considered traditional work because there's a tactile human connection because somebody physically touched it and built it or painted it or sculpted it, you know? Then what happened was we created these inventions, the lithograph, photography, um, the camera, and Xerox machines. And we were suddenly creating works. Well, he was talking about it as works of art created by machines and mechanical reproduction. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying what he was actually making this argument and saying, well, you know, those authentic uh, the, the no, I don't want to say authentic. I want to say traditional works of art had the sort of human aura, the sort of sense of time and place and space because they were made for a certain, you know, event or certain like moment, like the, the, the artist was thinking about something and painted a topic or had the model in front of it or the photographer was painting some, or taking a photograph of something and the building is decided at a specific spot. So everything was time physically, you know, and then it might have captured that moment in some way, but there was always that personal connection because the artist was touching it. Now, again, it was a 1936 article. It's been discussed probably hundreds of times by other people that have read this article and thought leaders and thinkers and intellectuals because people argue back and forth about what he meant about it, you know? And so then the counter argument, um, well, he was saying that uh, these works of art, these traditional works have this thing called an aura of a personal connection and that these mechanical works did not have that aura. They lost that human connection. Just like, you know, do you remember, I don't know if you ever heard of this term called six degrees of separation sure. from Kevin Bacon. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That everybody has at least six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, the old, the the other actor. Right. And uh, so with the machines, like if you do one Xerox copy, that's like a copy of like an original. But let's say you make a copy of the copy or you make a copy of a copy of a copy. Then what happens is it starts to fade. The authenticity of that original print or that original connection to that image is like getting fainter and fainter and fainter. And it's also removing if let's say it was a original drawing that you drew like it's uh, like a pencil drawing sure. then when you're making a copy of it you're it's like fading right yeah. so it's like that machine is taking away that 
It's that a personal he, touch. It, it, it yeah, really, there's a lot of ways to think about it from, I, I, I hunt my own food um, often. And so um, if you take it yourself, that's a different feeling eating that meat as opposed to I, I, I bought it at Publix or, or making knives, right? You know, if the machine yeah. is pressing the, pick a product, right? We all like the handmade thing. We want that, that, that this original artist made, they put together this piece of jewelry, this, this what have you, right? Even shoes, right? They want the specialty Nike where the guy only did like 10 of them, right? They want this specialty creation that wasn't done it, with. We want to feel special. We want, and yeah. that specialness has to do with connected back to the environment. When you said that you like, you shoot and you like, you hunt your own food, right? That or whatever. That's the same thing. It's like when you buy it at the grocery store, it's like, what is this? mystery part this mystery <laughs> you're, re you're removed from what it really takes <laughs> yeah to for, th and, for that to happen yeah and in fact architects have been aware of this problem of what's called reification and alienation from the environment and we in modernist architectural times they would try to find ways of designing buildings so that there was more of a connection like through the sun natural light views that kind of thing um to make a healthier indoor environment so that people don't feel like they're disconnected from the exterior. So, that, you know, that's part of what we do. Shoot, if so, people doesn't even, if you got to think about that for half a second, right? Imagine a house with no windows, right? I mean, you're essentially, yeah, yeah you, you that connection to the we outside. You already know that's unhealthy. Like artificial lighting and all that stuff is not so great for us. Right, and, terrible. you know, they're doing recent studies about the blue light from our iPhones and how, you know, that doesn't reflect the spectrum that, we need to exist as healthier human beings when natural sunlight has multiple spectrums that cannot be reproduced in artificial daylight. So if you spend too much in that artificial light, you're not going to be feeling all that you're, good. You're nailing it. Dr. Jack Cruz yeah. <laughs> uh, has been on this podcast often. Uh, he's been on here uh, at least two, maybe three times on the show. And uh, yeah, that that's uh, that is talked about a lot on, the, on, the, on so this show. In the article, Media Burn, you know, with the media burning and the virus raging, um, I talk about, like, the fact that, um, th that, okay, so he said that it's missing the authentic personal connections, these mechanical works. But what he also said, and this is something to think about, is that they actually had a power that was almost, he celebrated it. That's like, so what? They're losing the personal connect connection. He's basically sounding like, us when we get seduced by technology okay so they lose the personal connection but they've got this power to disseminate because think about xerox copies wow we can make thousands of xerox copies and pass them around and if you think about um i actually had to research this a little bit propaganda somebody told me my catholic friends told me that um propaganda started with the catholic church against martin luther <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, you could go back because he yeah. wanted to, he wanted to uh, and translate. And that was in the printing press, and he was putting all those things up and stuff. Yep. So then, if you think about that, that's what he was celebrating. He said, yes, but these mechanical works of art, like photography, lithography, and printing presses, and whatever, they could be moved around, and they could be passed around, and they have the power of having a multitude of them replicated. And that in itself is actually really important and that's like us thinking about the Arab Spring and how social media could spread democracy and through social media and the in, in, that whole thing. But the problem, and this is the part that I, we, I didn't include in the article, and this is something that I think people might want to be aware of. Um, the copies, when you see these copies of things, like copies of objects, copies of... Let's, there's like a lot of discussion about the Confederate flag. There's, co there, there's discussion about Bibles and um, what else? I forget. Like all kinds of stuff like oh, Black Lives Matter, like graffiti and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and T-shirts, right? And wearing hats. Think about what I just said. <laughs> They're all copies. They're not the authentic original. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Like it's like a like the Bible may have been printed what millions and millions of times. It's a copy. So what he was also saying was they lose that personal connection uh, to the original authentic thing that they were for. Yeah. 
But what happens is when people buy these copies, they start to imprint their own memory and their own meaning to it. So everybody's got their own relationship to the Bible or their own relationship to the flags or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. They think about it in their own symbolic way, okay? It's not always going to be the same meaning from one person to the next person to the next person to the next person. So part of that is the problem is when you actually, like, like wear these T-shirts, you're saying something about yourself, about what you identify with. And I'm not trying to politicize any of this, but you also have to be careful that when you are trying to get along with people, you don't necessarily want to be brandishing things that are that are going to be like stirring up controversy. Does this make sense? Yeah, sure. Like, so this is all I'm saying is, is that like oftentimes when you see these symbols being, you know, bandied about on media, it's for probably political reasons. Yeah. You know, yeah. but if you're seeing them on a person in real life, they might just be wearing it because they want to identify it. Yeah. Or, or accidental. Uh, you walk behind somebody wearing a red hat. One person automatically assumes what that means. And it turns around and says St. Louis Cardinals on it. Right. It's, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's a totally different color. <laughs> but, but we're perceiving it from a different angle, a different uh, life. Right. Somebody with a red hat. We know what that means. But it's it's not right. It's it's how we and see the angle. Us. It's our personal interpretation. Right. So we have to actually own it and say that maybe we're being a little bit trigger happy, a little bit too, yeah. you know, sensitive. A little bit. <laughs> and that's that's the media burn part because what that's part of the media burn part. It's like we become the media has politicized everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am not in any way. I, I sounds like I'm criticizing media. I am criticizing it, but I'm also, I have nothing. I think media is important because it's spreading like important information. But the problem is sometimes this information is wrong or not. Well, like you, you know, said, when we started, right, you we can't get mad at the government because the government is the people, right? Could we say that media is just the people in the media? Right. I mean, if if we if it's fair enough to correlate that the government or these organizations that were created, right, it's not getting mad at the organization or what that technology is, but possibly the people in that, just like the people using the technology, right? Like like yeah. people out there that are going, do we blame the technology? We we blame the people using the technology, right? And then so you also have to recognize that the blame game is also a problem if we're gonna try to get along. So like everyone's criticizing this person or that person. I'm like, okay, if that's their area that they're supposed to be doing a good job because that's what they're doing for a living, they deserve to be criticized. But they also need to understand that it's important to be capable of evolving and taking criticism so that you can continue to do a better job. And it's like, there's so much to go into right now. I mean, um, well, how, how many times is it where somebody, how do you get better unless somebody's telling you, Hey, uh, check yourself or, or we check ourselves about what we think, who we are, what we know, being able to question ourselves and open up to those things. Right. I mean, it, I, it amazed me how yes, but people also need to know how to give criticism too. Sure. Sure. So that that's part of the problem is, is like people are just venting and yeah. they're saying, anything they want and they're not thinking about hurting people's feelings or they're not thinking about the repercussions of what they say, which we used to do. It's, it's, it's I society is, it's called civilization for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole point of us is we're, we actually thrive more when we get along and we share. And like I was talking about how people were blaming government. Like there are bad institutions. There are bad Nonprofits are good institutions. They're good nonprofits. Just don't blame the don't play the blame game. But also, you know, you can have an opinion. That's the American way. We can all have an opinion. Yeah. I've had really stupid opinions in my life. I admit it. Yeah. You know, but I own them and I I learn and I hopefully grow from them. And I I you know I apologize. It's hard to be criticized. It's really hard. Yeah, it's a difficult thing. I, I actually I write about it a little bit. Um, one of the principles of change is uh, humility, right? It's uh, uh, yeah. humility equals C. Uh, H equals C. Humility equals competence. So if we can become humble in ourselves, to question ourselves, take the criticism, 
and and learn that we're only getting more competent or self competent right uh, along the way by exercising. I love how deep we got coming from architecture. I think that, <laughs> see, I think we have proven it, Mina, that you can t- start talking about buildings, designs, and and being part of a world fair or not. But us, you and I, being represented by McDonald's and Coke, right? <laughs> we, and now we're. Well, because- my area this is like i'm not just i am a interdisciplinary thought starter that's i have a branding expert who said mina tell the state department you're a thought starter because i was afraid of them at one point <laughs> <laughs> well it's um, it's it's true i mean i think the more that um us as a as a people can get that way and question things learn things question ourselves take that we do grow And unfortunately, we are so separated right now, um, more than I've actually ever seen it. And I remember saying that like, I don't know, eight years ago, right? I remember saying, man, we're really separated right now, more than I've ever seen. And I feel like I keep saying that year after year after year that we we find something else to uh, to almost hate each other for on each each side, which is ridiculous. Well, I have a mentor who is, he actually is living in Florida. Do you know Golden Beach, Florida? Um, Wow, I'm a native here. And no, I don't. I think it's on the it's on the eastern side. I can't remember, but it's in Golden Beach. Ever heard of the TED Talks? Sure, of course, the yeah. TED conference. The TED conference was invented by an architect. Ah, well, it's well <laughs> his, put together. Yeah, his name is um, Richard Sal Werman, W U R M A N, and he's living now in Golden Beach, Florida. Uh, he was living in Rhode Island, and then he moved down to Golden Beach about three years ago, two or three years ago, um, he invented the TED Talks and then he ran it for 25 years and then he sold it to Chris Anderson, I think in 2003 or 2006, I can't remember. And Chris Anderson, he's the one that took it global. Yeah. And, but, you know, it's and it was all about sharing ideas with each other. And so he's one of my mentors and he he sort of saw me as somebody that really likes to connect the dots between that we are more connected than we realize through so many ways. And it's in some ways my role to find ways of connecting us to each other. So even though you think that, Oh, she's an architect, she's like buildings. Like, no, I, I, just I think it makes know. sense. It connects though. We get, well, sorry, I said it there. It connects, right? The idea of being able to look at a space, build a space from the inside out and how that all connects together. You're looking yeah. at millions of connections and putting a building or a, or some piece together like that. So I can certainly say that, yeah, that makes perfect sense, that an architect would step back and be able to say, all right, we have to connect all of these things here into this perfect thing to get this final design. Yes. And then if you think about, um, sorry, I might have, if you think about, like, if, have, have you noticed the lighting in here has gotten darker? Yep. Yep. I've watched it. <laughs> Because that is the sun setting and that connection like that you've we have all heard of circadian rhythms and our bodies are regulated by the circadian rhythms. Um, And then when we have technology, it can distort perception, distort our environment and our connections to these circadian rhythms, which is why we are feeling so lost and disoriented Um, so by doing things like, you know, the health experts have been telling us to go outside safely, work out, do these kinds of things that's helping all of this stuff is helping. And so like, ultimately when I wrote that article, I I was talking about how each of us, if you're isolated at home can, can do things to, I mean, I don't, I, I, since I'm not a health expert, I don't want to be telling people what to do. And I, but I figured that by just showing that relationship to media that we have to media and that finding ways to disconnect from the media so that we can actually live again uh through our senses then it would help us feel a lot better yeah Uh, and i i I, I, go ahead go ahead go ahead uh, here's a short thing that i don't know if you want to try this if you keep your arms up in the air for two minutes it's going to naturally raise your endorphins. I learned that from a TED Talk, Amy Cuddy. (laughs) I've been doing it every day. (laughs) I I would love to do it with this shoulder, but I tore my labrum surfing in this shoulder. So I, this is, uh, this is, this might be enough. Well, I hope because this was, this this. 
this one's not going any further than that. I'm still, I got another two months of recovery still on this shoulder. Okay. Um, I, I'd love to do it. <laughs> I wish I could. You know how bad I want to reach up? You don't realize how much you want to use a part of your body until you can't use it anymore. And that, that shoulder, I, I miss it. I get to sleep one direction. Yeah. But you're, you're talking about squirreling us off. My God. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back, right, to, to how... But what we are reflected by in in the globe already is pretty bland. You know what I mean? From it's from not fast our food. Best. No, yeah. from fast food, these things that have watered our, our culture down uh, in a sense isn't isn't very reflective of, of who we are. No, it isn't. And other countries recognize the importance of showing the best of their country. It's it's the PR part, you know, in some ways, but it's not just PR. It's like when somebody invites you to a birthday party, you're going to take the time to to take a shower, <laughs> hopefully, to comb your hair. You know, like we women, we'll put makeup on or we'll, you know, we'll do our best to look our best, to smell good, <laughs> to, <laughs> to put our better clothing on than like our sweatpants. Like I'm wearing sweatpants right now. <laughs> I did, did, like I put makeup on, just very light makeup <laughs> on for this because I want to make sure that you know, people know that I respect your show, that I'm going to take my, I'm going to take a small amount of effort to put into, you know, behaving the best way by looking the best way. And that's what we're supposed to be doing at the World's Fairs. We're supposed to be showcasing the best of the American people. Uh, And the movie I made, uh, you know, I never even talked about the personal connection of why I would even do this. Um, there's a couple of things that I showcase in the film. Number one, we showcase the best of America's world fairs when we did the 1967 New York, um, Mon- the Montreal World Expo. Um, and and the a 1967 one, we created the geodesic dome, which Walt Disney, I don't know if you know the relationship of Walt Disney, he loved world's fairs. Uh, he went to the 1939 World's Fair and was so enthralled by it that he decided to, in effect, he he created Disney World, Disney Land, Disney Land, because he thought that he could bring the World's Fair to America. Um, and then he also had the small. It's a small world is a direct, you know, copy of what uh, one of the World's Fairs uh, huh. exhibits. And then, so that was 1939. He went, I think, when he was younger. Then he created Disneyland in 1955. And then then he went to the 1967 Montreal World Expo where the United States did this glass, I mean, this sort of plastic bubble, which was done by Buckminster Fuller. And uh, he was so enthralled by it that he created Epcot Center. I was going to, when we first started, I didn't know, I had no idea. And I'm in Disney's backyard over here. And know, born and raised behind uh, Disney World. But uh, I was going to say when we started, the, it, Epcot is what I was going to mention when you were talking about World Fair yeah. and all the cultures coming together, right? And uh, us travelers have reduced Epcot down to try to drink around the world, right? Have, have a drink at every culture on Epcot, right? But that's, it seemed like, but even that is such a surface experience, right, of, of, of what that, of what those cultures really do offer, what they bring, right? And that's what this World's, World's Fair was yeah, doing. Yeah, I mean... I see the influence. People, yeah, and some people are lucky enough to be able to afford to travel all the, over the world, and they can see that the people of the world are just like us. Yeah. And that that is the point. It's, like, it's about seeing people as they are. And, you know, when I first traveled, I, I think the first trip I went to, oh, wait, wait, I went to Montreal with my family. <laughs> I went to see Niagara Falls and stuff like that. And Connecting I, dots. Yeah. And, and stuff like that. But, but it's like, that is partly what is important about the World's Fair. It's called public diplomacy, which is the people to people connection and it's physical connection, but it's also, you know, we're trying to evolve and we're using a lot more technology to connect to each other. So I am not in any way saying I hate, I, I am not saying I hate technology. Look, we're using technology. I obviously love technology, but I'm saying that we need to also recognize that we wake up in our bodies every morning. We are affected by a physical world where we navigate through. Then we get tired and then we go to sleep. So we are in so many ways bound by our bodies and therefore we cannot forget that there are things that our body needs to stay healthy and that means disconnecting from 
technology to make sure that we can take care of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and one, so, one of those also is human connection, right? Is, is that the human is, connection we need and, and it's such a weird place right now. It's, it's, it is technology is what, what we thank God we have, right? Otherwise you and I couldn't do this show, right? That we can use it for certain things. Right. And, but I think you're right that it dampens the senses, the senses, over time, and I, I think it really does. People forget what it's like to walk in a forest, right? Forget what it's like to talk to somebody in person. I think it dampens those senses, and I think that's kind of where we were starting with the the artwork that was created with the senses, with the hands, with the eyes at the moment, right? Without that, the the machine doing it for us, right? Or, or some sort of um, a non traditional way of art, right? And even today, uh, what a lot of people are doing online, right? Be that funny skits or whatever, they would call this art. Right, they they would call what they're creating some sort of uh, artistic expression. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, there's a lot that we can keep going on here, but I didn't know. Like, well, I wanted to finish um, walking through. Um, well, uh, about your film, right? The the connection mm -hmm. to you making this film, um, and, and sort of. How oh, I forgot got... to mention how my how why would I work? Why would I raise so much money and I didn't pay myself? I paid everybody else. Why would we spend so many years? Um, so if you look up the film, you'll you'll be reading the log line, and the log line says, "Daughter of immigrants, an idealistic American architect, that's me, struggles to keep her dream alive as she journeys to discover why America abandoned World Fairs." So, like I mentioned, I started the film in China. I came back. I was really disturbed by what I saw. I started doing research. I went to the library, actually, what I did. <laughs> I got that in my <laughs> Yes. I actually went to the library, and I got this book, which I have in my bookshelf. And on the back of the book, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Expo 67. Wow, we brought the moon rock to Japan. This is so cool. Like, the year after 1969. Like, who is this guy? Oh, his name was Jack Macy. That's the guy that wrote the book with an, an, two people wrote the book. Oh, his phone number is listed on the back of the book. So I called him up. I ended up following him and filming him for six and a half years. He was a genius. Wow. A total genius. In fact, he might be, this is a whole nother story, but uh, Ben Affleck bought the rights to turn this story called The Ghost Army, which is about World War II artists and creative people who had their own army unit and their entire job was to fake the Nazis into thinking that our army was in places that it wasn't with cardboard and inflatable tanks. He was the youngest member of that unit. And that, in so many ways, was how he learned about the real and the fake because he was faking what? the Germans. Now, out. I'm a history buff, especially <laughs> World War One and Just look Two. Up the goal. Look up the ghost army because Rick what? Beyer made a documentary about it. He's a friend of mine. And, yeah. and you know, I, he, we shared resources because I covered Jack in this movie. And he's so brilliant. He was so brilliant. And I followed him around. And he reminded me of my dad. He was very loud and he yelled a lot. And like, uh, I wasn't intimidated by it. So I just kept <laughs> following around. And then at one point he was like, I, I, so I was learning how to make a film. And I heard that you have to get really personal. I was learning from top filmmakers. And they were saying, you know, you got to show character and you want to show them three-dimensionally not just like one dimensionally because he was yelling so much and stuff so I was trying to find some sort of vulnerability in him but he would not let me film him in vulnerable ways because he spent his entire life defending America's creative people and the best of American creative people and you know and so that's what he showed at Expo 67 in that big geodesic dome and he's brought bringing the moon rock and Elvis's guitar this was when we did it right and then we totally tanked by the time I went to the Shanghai World Expo in 2010. It was so bad. I mean, you really have to see the movie to see how bad. Everyone cringes. This is why the State Department is, like, coming to me because I covered this issue. And and it's like, they. so what we're doing for Dubai, I mean, I'm not designing. the. I'm just critiquing and stuff like that. When's that one? But, that's coming well, up. Wasn't it, supposed, wasn't it supposed to happen? It got delayed, though, right? Yes, it got delayed. Yeah, it was supposed to be this October, and because of COVID, it's been delayed one year to October 2021. Yeah, like everything, yeah. our everyone's entire life has been delayed till 2021. Everyone, yeah, everyone's been delayed. But in fact, the delay is better for our pavilion because 
of the controversy I uncovered in the film, the defunding of our U.S. pavilion and Congress fighting each other, saying, we don't want to, we don't think we should be spending, it's, it's a lot of like infighting and stuff like that. So I bring that out in the movie and I did it with my heart because it turns out I became an architect because my mom and dad got engaged at the 1964 New York World's Fair. Yeah, and if anybody has, oh, go ahead. So when I was 12, my parents showed, my dad showed me their pictures and it's when I suddenly discovered architecture. So fast forward to 2010, I totally forgot about this. Okay, so then I go to China, I film this horrible disaster, I come back and I'm absolutely appalled and really depressed. And so then I decided, and, and then I got angry, and then I turned that anger into something creative, which is the making of the film. And so when I made this film, it was truly made with my heart. It was, it's my love letter to this country. And I never knew I was this patriotic, but, <laughs> but I am a very patriotic because I'm doing this as my public service. I figure this is something that I have to let Americans know about. So yeah. hopefully we'll, you know, do more screenings at some point or another. Well, you know? maybe do like a, a, a YouTube premiere or something and run it once and then pull it down. Um, yeah, possibly. I, the problem is I have I have contracts with Universal and Sony. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, don't do that. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. Like, cause I have a Simon and Garfunkel song that I have for seven years, and then I have I have an original score with a 42-piece orchestra uh, that it was, it's just, fun. I mean, you can go to the website and listen to the music because I have the music on the website. I saw that, and the trailer's, yeah. the trailer's beautiful. I, I know the, I don't want to even ruin the trailer at all, but yeah. the pictures that you show um, when you're saying how, you didn't even know that this this picture would be the inspiration for the film you go to go to make later. Uh, I'll let people have to go to the trailer and watch it. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So maybe one. I was actually in Florida showing the film. Where at? I was Sarasota. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where my mom yeah. was. Yeah, I was Allegedly. there for the Sarasota Architectural Foundation in January, I think. Yeah, uh, Sarasota is known for some yeah. artwork stuff. I mean, the the Ringling Paul Brothers. Rudolph. Yeah, yeah Ring that's where I was. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, that's uh, that's where the Dolly Museum is too, uh, in, yeah. in Sarasota. Yeah, Ringling College is. of Art, is Ringling College of Art, and something. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, they they brought they flew me out there. I flew, and then I I've done Pittsburgh. I've done three North Carolina screenings at New York five times i've literally been crisscrossing the country until the covid crisis <laughs> so, the, so the only way people can watch it is that is that one of these screenings right now because like people are like well why don't you make it available for streaming it's like i forgot to mention i have a job <laughs> <laughs> that's paying my bills and that job is i teach architecture and my problem is I'm only one person and I do have like a producer. I've got all kinds of people, but a documentary, it's not like I have millions of dollars and millions of people or I don't have like dozens of people helping me. So I'm doing everything myself and I teach ethics and I also do things like business contracts and that kind of thing. So I write my own business contracts. I know how to do a lot of stuff, but I also know that it's important to do things the right way, which means that you don't rush things. Yeah. And there are, there's a time and a place for everything. I might end up doing something with streaming as we get closer to the Dubai 2021 um, expo. I'm oh, not sure yet. Yeah, that's yeah. right. We, we didn't get there. Uh, what are we doing for the Dubai? What are we building? What are we making? We have something. I can't. It there. It's. It's. I don't know if it's. It's. Cla I don't know if it's classified. It's. Uh, I know. I it's, figured all you my couldn't emails, say it. All my emails are sensitive. Oh. <laughs> well. Sensitive. I can't. So and then like um, and I'm not the one designing it, but I'm doing everything we can to showcase some of what I hope. You know. What, you know. I'm. They. They. You know. I'm. I'm critiquing. Let's put it that way. And it's actually unofficial. So, like, even though this might be a public pod podcast, State Department, you know, it's not official yet. I mean, like, uh, we're not advertising any of this. 
Oh, no kidding. Uh, All right. Yeah. So we get a little it's government in, insight right here that we, we may yeah. we may be participating in the in the World I Fair. Participating. I participating. Oh, what the design is, though, is what we can't. We can't. Yeah, I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to know where we, we gotta know, know where you are. On. Well, we know where you are. You've been on this podcast, so if something happens to you, Mina, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna no, know. No, no, it's not, not that. It's just that there's a lot of contracts and, and there's a lot of stuff that they don't tell me, and I don't want to screw things up. Yep. Um, no, you're smart. If it comes, especially from this podcast, certainly, certainly don't say anything um, <laughs> that that may ruin that. Because I'm glad that you're a part of this project and and the love that you put in not only to your film but to architecture itself. It may be pushing America back to what it was in, uh, I don't know, 69 in Montreal or something like that. Yeah, 67, Montreal. 67, yeah. Yeah, I know. Six, 69, we went to the moon. And then 1970, we did the biggest air inflatable in the world in Japan, and we brought the moon rock. Um, and the lines were amazing. I mean, it's just, it, it like, people were so intrigued. They wanted to see the best of America and they got to see the American space program. And so uh, we're going to be showcasing stuff that hopefully will showcase some of the best of American innovation. Again, I have no responsibility to the design or anything like that, but I am giving my opinion and hoping that, that the, my, my, my critique and my opinion will be followed. <laughs> well, well, many times the ones that are hiring to critique those that are building it are the ones with the real vision anyway uh, that, that can see it. So I, the humbleness approach to what you're doing, but I know if I'm hiring the person to critique the people that I've hired probably has the design eye um, ultimately in my opinion. But I think it's a beautiful thing. You're being you're generous. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I mean it. I'm, I mean that, right? Because you're technically the consultant. You're not even having to do the actual work. You're just saying, don't do it that way. Add this to it. Do this. This is missing. But you're the perfect person for it, um, based even just on the video, what we've talked about, your love for architecture, and especially the, the personal connection uh, of architecture itself and how that reflects to our own lives or reflects our uh, nation. To other people like that it's a serious project that that you're be a part of right there mina yeah but it's let's let's see how it goes it, <laughs> yeah right i don't want to be too attached in case we make like 68th place right on this thing <laughs> well yeah oh, i i can't say this much um i know how hard it is to do this to a limited level because i was on a u.s pavilion team for the Venice Biennale, which is another international exhibition. I had nothing to do with the design either. Um, the team was um, from the Institute of Urban Design. And it was um, like, so the Venice Biennale is this Biennale that's held every year, but it rotates art um, in, the, in the odd years and architecture in the even years. So it's been going on for 70s, five, 70, I don't know how many years, over 70 something years. And the year that I participated, um, I was on their team as a project manager and I raised money for it, but I didn't, you know, the team that did it was, they're just phenomenal. It was Kathy Lang Ho, Michael Sorkin, one of my mentors at the at Harvard GS Graduate School of Design, which is, by the way, he died of COVID. Oh. Um, yeah, I was very upset. And that was why I wrote the Media Burn article because oh. I was, so upset. He's the one that introduced me to the ant farm. Oh, no. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, it was very sad. And he, he had cancer and I didn't know he had cancer. I spoke to him two weeks before he died. And mm. then I found out that he died in the newspaper. Oh, ouch. So, yeah. So, so, um, I was part of a U.S. pavilion that, you know, um, again, had major challenges, but we won one of the four awards out of 55 countries. It was oh, the wow. first time in history that our U.S. Pavilion had won for the architecture Biennale. And Kathy Langho and Michael Sorkin and Anne Guinet, they were the ones that were putting this whole thing together. They had a huge team of us. You know, we were just doing it. I don't think anybody really got paid to do it either. <laughs> I mean, I just did my, I just kind of did it because, again, public service. Public service. <laughs> Can people see that piece anywhere? The, you the can pavilion? look it up. 
um, well, the the Biennale Pavilion is like a permanent building, and then an exhibition is mounted every year. Mm. So the one that we did showcased, it was back in 2012, and it showcased some of the entrepreneurial things that were happening in this country due to the um, Great Recession. So like even though governments were losing funding, streets were going with potholes, everything was happening, people were losing jobs. And so then what it tried to do was showcase what American architects and designers were working with the community. I mean, not just American architects, it was all about community building. And the exhibition was called Spontaneous Interventions, Design Actions for the Common Good. I so, like it. yeah, and so that was the exhibition that we did, and you know, um, you know, my role was mostly to just fundraise <laughs> because. <laughs> well, I was you said you're good at it, so that's what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, Michael asked me to do it, and um, you know, and my, and why I agreed to do that was because I was critiquing that in my film, the fundraising part. And so I needed to know how bad it was. It was really bad. It was really hard. <laughs> so I don't envy anybody that has to do this work because it's hard when you're the only country in the world that does not want to pay for our own pavilion. And we have to go. I will tell you this much about our UAE pavilion. The United Arab Emirates is paying for our U.S. pavilion because Congress won't pay for it. Oh, my God. So if if you want to do this architectural project that represents us to the rest of the world here in this design phase, of course, of of course, we got a loan to do it. That we are certainly reflective of the American culture. We're yeah. getting loans from from no, the. No, not a loan. They're giving it. They're giving us money to to do. It. Yeah, that it sounded better with the joke of the loan, right? That of course, so someone is either charity or we have some sort of loan. We're going in debt to. We're gonna owe somebody something. Nobody just gives you that. I'm just being yeah, honest. And there are other things that I find to be a problem, but even though I don't agree with everything that is happening, I still want to help. Yeah. And so I'm putting my own ego aside because it really isn't about me. It seriously isn't. It's about making sure that we as Americans have the best representation we can. So I'm doing this because I care about us. I want to make sure that we do not get um, represented by symbols of money and war. That's a beautiful thing, Mina, and thank you for doing what you're doing for us. And I, and thank you for the, the brief education. I know there's so much more in there about architecture and, and how it's related to so many things. I think when people listen to this podcast, they will take another look at the space they're in, the buildings they walk by, uh, perhaps even the art and quotes they put out and how they connect and how much uh, architecture plays a, a role in, in our lives. I mean, uh, thank you. And please, people, watch the film, too. Where, where can they go? Well, websites, uh, Instagram? Oh, yeah. So our website, all, it's very easy to find me. You just, did you notice you just Googled my name and you found me? Right yeah, I actually did. <laughs> so did. Um, it's uh, faceofanationmovie.com. And so it's not, it's faceofanationmovie.com. Um, and then if you just Google my name, you'll find the USC website. Uh, I, I'm actually teaching hybrid starting August 17th. So I'm going to be going in with a mask and all Oh, <laughs> yeah. school starting back up. That's yeah. a, that's a whole nother podcast about whether what we should be doing with that. <laughs> well, um, we're going to do it safely. We're going to do it safely. And, yeah. you know, and I'm actually, I don't have antibodies, darn it, though. I was hoping I would. I just got test, tested for antibodies because I felt like I got it last December. So I, um, I, I felt the same uh, in January. Yeah. yeah, but no antibodies, darn it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've seen, I've read a few things that the antibodies only last three weeks or so to be able to pick up on certain tests and stuff. So we so. might have gotten it. You never know. <laughs> I like to be optimistic. I think we did. I think we did, so we're, we're probably safe on it, right? Yeah, okay. Mm. Really, thank you for having me on your your podcast and your show. I think it's a wonderful, you know, we had, I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, Mina, yeah. I enjoyed it uh, as much as well. So thank you for coming on and uh, sharing this with you. Uh, we'll end up uh, posting this thing uh, tomorrow morning. Great. Good night. Good night, Mina. Bye. Thank you again. Bye.